Mr. Brittany Tammy, who is the director of photography. All right. Great job. As well as like, oh my God, a thousand other jobs. Uh, colorist. <laughs> we all and, so many jobs. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but uh, first of all, I can't thank you guys enough for coming to see this film. This was uh, a, a, a crazy passion project, a labor of love that uh, I wrote back in the, in the spring of 2020. Um, and then I think it was towards the end of spring that uh, Britt kind of said, why don't we just do it? Let's, let's make it a film. And we looked at the first uh, act and said, okay, well, we could shoot that for practically nothing. So why don't we go ahead and shoot that and then use that as a proof of concept uh, and send it out to producers in the industry and see if we can't get the funding for the rest of the film that way. Uh, so that's what we did in, in the fall of 2020. Uh, we, uh, we shot the first act and I cut it together. Britt did the color, I did the mix. We sent it to uh, Paper Street Pictures, uh, or actually, I'm sorry, we sent it to uh, a man named Peter Kuklowski who I had met through doing festivals of short films that we had made together. And he said, all right, let's let's do it. And he got us in touch with Paper, uh, with Paper Street Pictures, who uh, loved it and read the rest of the script and said, whatever you guys need. And that's how we got in touch with Lance. So just to give you guys a little bit of background, uh, but more than anything, I want to open things up to you guys uh, for, for the Q&A. If you guys have any questions, any thoughts on, or, or uh, any questions you want to ask any of us, uh, please, now is, now is the time. Uh, any, anybody have any questions? Yes, sir. Thank you, yeah, that's a great question. So uh, the, the Lance story is that um, he was always kind of at the top of our list uh, of, of who to play that, that role uh, for obvious reasons, uh, metatextual uh, legacy aside. Um, we, we know that he was just an incredible actor that we really wanted to work with, uh, but we never thought it was possible to get him uh, until Paper Street Pictures uh, got the script in front of him, and that was monumental. He read it and called me <laughs> and uh, had like a two and a half long hour conversation just about the story and the themes and the characters uh, and his character and how he was connecting the themes to his own personal life. And you could tell just he was so instantly passionate about the project and he said, let's do it. Yeah. Um, so that's when we got him down to Jacksonville. Um, and, and so yes, he, he read the script first and said yes. It wasn't until after several conversations later that I said, hey, if you'd like to watch the first two acts, which we had already like shot and pretty much edited, um, I was like, would you like that? And he was like, sure, you know, send it. And I did, and that I think helped him have a better understanding of how to play Gareth, but the funny thing is, is that I don't think he realized that I had played Gareth, <laughs> because on set, he seemed to indicate, like he was like, that guy you got for, for, for younger me, it's great. And I was like, thank you, Lance. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, just a, what a, what a talented son of a bitch. I'm like, thank you, thank you. <laughs> it wasn't until, like, I think the last day of shooting that he was like, that was you, wasn't it? <laughs> uh, and, but, but uh, again, like, I think that, uh, that was really helpful, but at the same time, I didn't want his, like, portrayal of Gareth to go solely off of uh, that uh, you know, that, that footage. I wanted him, because Gareth at that point had evolved over, over a long period of time. And so I worked very closely with Lance to, to not just, not, not really try to replicate Gareth as he existed in Acts 1 and 2, but elevate him to where he, what he would become uh, in, in those years uh, that, that Lance was portraying. Uh, but yes, thank you, that's a very good question. Yes, sir. So everything with Cherry on the screen is live. Uh, so there was no compositing with, with Cherry. Uh, we had built like a kind of a, a makeshift like white void. Britt, do you want to talk about like how, how we sort of did that? Yeah, I mean, we set up uh, Tatum, uh, Cherry, in a separate space and she could hear the performances happening in the main room, which by the way was also a closet. Um, and so they were able to, to, to vibe off their performances, and I think that really helps the time of the film, uh, because the, the pace is, is pretty solid. How so. long was the HDMI cable? Oh, 35 feet or something. <laughs> yeah, it's, 
we, did, we had crazy shit going on, but yeah. uh, it worked. I mean, you know, where there's a will, there's a way. I mean, that's, that's low budget guerrilla filmmaking. So uh, we, we, I think we knew early on we wouldn't have money to composite all that stuff together. I mean, that would have been wow. a disaster. But the movie looks like a million bucks. Oh, thank you very much. It does. And I guess it sounds like initial filming in that one room was just uh, um, basically uh, during the time of COVID, I would assume then. So it kind of worked out. You're there isolated. You're in a room, basically. It was one set. I remember when you were soliciting for, hey, does anyone have any warehouse space or something like that or something we could, like, you know, fashion in a room. But I guess just being, you know, through you and obviously the crew or whatever, so... I'm assuming pretty safe and, and good getting on there. Yeah, that, that was kind of the, from, from the get-go, that was yeah. sort of the intention. It's like, okay, is there a way that you can tell a compelling story in one location with three characters? Right, right? that's and, awesome. And then sort of built it around that and, and said, like, okay, is there, is there a film that we can make that would be COVID safe, right? Because that was always kind of the priority, yeah. is making sure that we can make a film and do it safely. So everyone on set was masked up. I mean, we really only had, like, two or three crew members in the room at any given time. Uh, and then the three actors who were spread across the table. And there were even a couple of instances where, you know, because of social distancing, we like kept safe distance in the scene and then almost had to like kind of, I, I had to like sort of uh, bring characters closer together <laughs> through, <laughs> through some digital augmentation. Uh, but uh, yeah, so that was always kind of the, yeah. COVID really was sort of the obstacle that we had to just sort of reshape as an opportunity for creativity. And that's what led this film to become what it is, wow. uh, and we knew it was a risk. Doing one location movie with just pure dialogue, that made us more conscientious of making sure that the dialogue worked on its own. That's great. Um, and of course, I think it's, it's hugely elevated by the performances. And, and, and the performances, and, yeah. I mean, and, the, and the, direct, and the uh, cinematography, too, and the visuals. Well, I mean, it all played together, of course, but I mean, I, I mean, to, to, to think that we are where we are now with, I mean, screening it. I mean, we've screened in this theater before, but not like this. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, he just spent a what, week and a half all over the country. And we were like, we were number 10 on iTunes, which is just crazy. No, right. yeah. But it's, it's all a tribute to all of the people coming together. It's a great story, well-written, amazing performances. The shooting was okay. Um, <laughs> but, but you know what I mean? I mean, the, the, the production design, the mix, everything came together and made a, a compelling piece and we thank you guys for supporting can i follow up on that it sounds so, like after your long one i'm hearing like awards flying around like crazy you were speaking of tatum i guess cherry is that true she's winning like yes, a best so actress tatum or? just won a, uh, an award at our brazilian pre uh, uh, premiere yes yeah, so tatum, wow. tatum who plays cherry <laughs> uh who was 11 at the time that we started shooting this uh now she's 14 but um uh, uh, she just won Best Actress. Like, well, not, not Best Child Actress, <laughs> Best Actress. Nice. At our uh, Brazilian premiere in, uh, I can't pronounce the Thanos name. Boa? Thanos Boa. Thanos Boa. Uh, which which just be happened. Wrong. <laughs> 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 but that's what just but uh, And of course, obviously, we'll be writing her coattails for the rest of her career. <laughs> um, but we're so glad to have like met her so many years, even before we filmed Artifice Girl, and to have known her and developed trust with her working on several projects, and then getting to, to give her a, a, you know, a role like this, which is so profoundly difficult for anybody, let alone a child, to, to play. Right. And play an AI that then like becomes transcendent and then has to like confuse itself with being human. Like, wow. Uh, but she not only like met her expectations, which were insanely high, she exceeded them by far. Awesome. Uh, so we're, we're very grateful. And again, Jacksonville local uh, lived like a few blocks away from where I used to live. So uh, it's, that's just that's just Jacksonville for you. Uh, and, and yes, yes, sir. The dialogue is so incredibly technical. Um, as a writer, how, what percentage of that did you already know? And how much did you have to research into fill in? That is so incredible. Yes, I, uh, I have no background in tech or AI or any of that. Uh, for, for me, it wasn't about telling a story about an AI. I had read some articles over the years about how uh, technology and AI were, were, was being used to combat uh, online predators and traffickers and criminals. And I just thought that was so cool. Like, what a fantastic way to use technology for good. And I thought, well, that would be really fascinating to kind of get some insight into seeing like what kinds of conversations were the developers having behind closed doors? What kinds of debates were they having about you know, the technical challenges of this. Um, 
But the idea kind of sat dormant for a while until COVID uh, and revisiting the scripts and trying to see if there was anything that could work as like virtual stage readings. And then suddenly there was like this epiphany of like, okay, maybe there's a thematic parallel between the budding adolescence of AI and childhood trauma. And once that kind of connection was, was made in my mind, I was like, okay, this is a story that I have to tell. Um, and that's what really informed the, the story overall. So it took two weeks of intense research because <laughs> I knew that the film needed to have like an, an accuracy to, uh, to, the, to the language, right? So uh, I, I took an online course uh, on machine learning, did a lot of research, but the, the most helpful form of research was actually having phone calls and Zoom calls with real uh, professionals in those uh, sectors, uh, people that were actually doing this and building AI, building technology that was hunting down predators and criminals and stuff. And not only was that helpful to, again, sort of immerse yourself in that language, in that technical jargon, but also get insights into these real people um, and how they, as human beings, were dealing with this job that is so, like, I, I can't even fathom, and that was part of what drew me to the story, was like, how do you deal with the fact that you have to do this, this job, which is so important, but so hard to do, um, and use technology in such a, a brilliant way? Um, so that was very, very helpful. Uh, I, I want to ask you, though, before I get another question, uh, <laughs> because Amos is, I think, a perfect example of how uh, I, I remember like having a lot of discoveries while having conversations with tech people about how that informed my perspective on AI. And I put a lot of those kinds of debates and internal struggles inside of Amos. And I want to hear, because I love the way that you talk about approaching Amos as a character. Uh, so Franklin sends me the script and I read it and it already told me it wanted me to play Amos, but I didn't agree with Amos's position at all. I thought AI was a tool um, and that was it. However, we had a lot of Zoom rehearsals. We did a lot of uh, research. We did, we had a lot of discussions or whatever until by the time it was time to shoot, my, my total opinion had changed. Um, because I understood that the technology was not the issue, that people are the issue, and whatever you put into AI is what you're going to get out of a of AI. Like he, you know, he alluded to that childhood trauma. It's like whatever you put into that child, that's what you're going to get out of it. So, um, yeah. <laughs> I like to stop abruptly. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, again, I, I think like Amos is one of those characters that we just feel so emotionally attached to because of, of their humanity, which uh, I can only take a very small portion, portion of the credit for. Uh, I think your, your performance is, is a huge part, especially in my favorite moment, which happened organically on the set, which was sort of a, a moment of inspiration, I think, for, for you, where it was just this moment where he like ha makes eye contact and just stares at Cherry and says, I can't tell the difference. And that moment we hadn't orig originally planned, but it was this perfect way to get the audience to just immediately kind of put them in his shoes so that they could better empathize with him in a second act. And like Amos, the audience shouldn't be able to tell that she's CGI because she's not, she's played by a real actress. We didn't even, we talked about doing like deep fakes of her face on top of her face, but we didn't want to do any of that so that the audience could see the way that Amos was seeing, him, uh, seeing her. So uh, yeah. Uh, uh, any any other questions? Any other, yes, uh, let's let's go with you first. Um, okay, so Star Trek nerd. And <laughs> one thing that Dana mentioned on one episode was that they had an algorithm for blinking. <laughs> I promise that she's not a plant because, like, I, like this is this is my favorite thing to talk about. This is my favorite story about Tatum on set. We, we were on set, and I, I, admittedly, at the time, at the time that we started shooting, hadn't watched Next Gen. I had started watching it. My sister was like, read the script. I was like, you have to watch Next Gen. I'm not into Star Trek. But then I started watching. I was like, oh my god, it's some of the best television ever. Uh, and so I, I hadn't gotten to that point yet uh, of uh, like the episode where he's on trial and all that. Uh, but I remember being on set with Tatum, like already on the screen. We're already like halfway through shooting, and I just had this moment of like, 
oh, shoot, should she be blinking? Should she not be blinking? Like, are we gonna need to digitally remove her blinks? And Tatum goes, oh, no, 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 I already did my research. I already looked into it. They blink too much, and there's actually an interesting kind of like rhythm to the way that they blink. There's an algorithm, and I've already looked into it, so don't worry, I've got it, I've been doing it. And I'm like, <laughs> that's a, yeah, that's a testament to Tatum. Uh, this 11-year-old this is like, no, 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 I've already done my research. Like, I got it. <laughs> Uh, but that's just like one of many multiple examples of, of how Tatum was like exceeded her expectations. So thank you for setting that up. I love telling that story. I saw a hand over here. We've got a question here. Yes, sir. So I got a two-part question. Go for it. Uh, in the final scene, did you work with a choreographer or a dancer? And what made you end it with dance and, you know, that marriage between blending from AI to real reality? Yeah, great question. So uh, for me, from, from a writer's perspective initially, it, I, I kind of knew like, okay, we have to end the story with her expressing herself in a purely human artistic way, right? And for me, it was like, okay, she can do a painting, she can do this, she can do that, but uh, sort of very quickly it was like, okay, dancing makes the most sense because one, it's, it's like a showcase of her physical ability, which is something that she's like not quite used to yet and is sort of exploring and experimenting with. And also it's, it's very cinematic, right? It's something that would be really fun to film. It just so happened that Tatum Matthews, our 11 year old prodigy, was also an extremely talented dancer and had already been taking dancing lessons for like five years. So I, I went to her uh, incredible uh, dance choreographer and, and teacher. Uh, her name is Brittany Boyd, which I highly recommend you guys look up. Uh, the, 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 all of her students and everything that she's done is absolutely incredible. And like, as soon as I like, Tamara Tatum's mother was like, told me about her, I, I looked at her stuff and I was like, okay, perfect, perfect. I gotta talk to her. <laughs> and uh, she came up with the choreography for the dance and uh, also collaborated with Tatum uh, and in, in small part with me too. I just sort of talked about what kinds of themes I wanted to be included in the dance. And then Brittany and Tatum, uh, with mostly Brittany kind of like leading her into, here's what you're gonna do, uh, and then allowing Tatum to sort of have moments of inspiration and improvisation uh, so that we kind of see Cherry begin to like explore and understand. And then by the height of the dance, she's doing this heavily choreographed, very complicated, and I'm sure some dancers will say very impressive uh, bits of choreography at the end. Uh, to me, like I think it's a perfect way to uh, abstractly, uh, you know, demonstrate the themes, um, while also cinematically just being a beautiful climax for the film. Uh, so thank you. What a great question. Thank you so much. Uh, any other questions before we wrap up? Oh yes, yes. All right, we'll start here. Yes, ma'am. At the end, um, were the receptacles ashes on the mantle or whatever we hear? So uh, yeah, I. I uh, I've been, I've been trying not to like give too much away about things in the film that I feel like can be left up to interpretation. But what I will say is that uh, that is a theory that I think makes a lot of sense, considering that that's what was brought forward at the, in, in the church after what it seemed like was a funeral, right? Um, and yeah, I mean, it's no coincidence that uh, we see uh, Cherry has another one <laughs> next to that one, and then after, uh, uh, you know, Gareth leaves, we see a third one with Gareth's armband. I think, you know, the implication there is, is relatively like clear. Uh, yes, I think that those represent um, the, the passing of, uh, of her, what were her parents, essentially. Um, and that's, that's where they shall stay. Um, so yeah, uh, that's, thank you. Uh, other questions I saw? Uh, yes, yes ma'am there. Yes, yes, so uh, this is another thing that I, I'm sure is, uh, it's, it's a very subtle kind of line, but uh, when, when Gareth addresses the cable and he says coolant and she says vapor, so uh, the idea is that it's, it's not, I'm sorry, this is getting, this is gonna, like, we're gonna get a little nerdy here, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm gonna show my, uh, expose my inner door. <laughs> um, so, so at that point, it's, it's likely that uh, autonomous androids will not need auxiliary power, they will have batteries that will be very easy to, to recharge. Uh, but those cables, I think, are probably supplying some form of coolant, something that is uh, using to, to uh, yes, yeah, to, to lubricate her joints 
uh, particularly because she's been straining and dancing and overusing them. Uh, so for us, it wasn't like necessarily a literal symbol of like her being tethered, but obviously, I mean, uh, very, very much symbolically, she is still has this connection, this sort of tether. Um, and sh just in our minds, it was a, a very immediate way to distinguish that she wasn't entirely human. We didn't want to have her like an ex machina with a transparent torso. We didn't want like her to have like missing a face or anything. She needed to be indistinguishable for her purpose. Um, but that was just a very kind of immediate and recognizable sort of indication that, okay, yeah, she's not human and she is not entirely autonomous. Um, so yeah, that's, that's why we went with that uh, decision. I saw another hand right behind you, yes? Yeah, I mean, uh, that was, for, for us, we were like, we want to do this safely, first and foremost. So uh, everyone was masked, um, unless cameras were rolling for the, for the cast. Um, but otherwise, during rehearsals, during everything, we did all of our rehearsals over Zoom. We did several, which actually, I think, benefited the film immensely, because it's such a dense, dialogue-driven film. That really helped us get off book. Uh, everybody took COVID tests. They, you know, did the, uh, all of that. So yeah, there was a lot of challenges. Even in, through Act 3, we had to, uh, I think we've actually got uh, a, uh, a COVID specialist, one of the COVID specialists is here tonight, Grace Brown. Uh, who, were, were you on one of the days uh, that Lance was there? Okay, so you, yeah, so uh, Grace Bryan here, who, who has fingers that have been plunged up of Lance Henriksen's nose. Uh, like all of that we, we took very, very seriously, also knowing that we were hopefully going to get someone like Lance, we had to hold ourselves to a standard that would, you know, uh, suffice for like SAG, right? Even though none of us in the first act were SAG yet. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, we still made sure that we were following all of their COVID guidelines just in case we ended up getting someone like Lance, which we did. So we're very grateful that we, we were incredibly safe um, and, and took extra precautions to make sure that this was a COVID safe set, which I believed very almost obnoxiously. <laughs> uh, I was very strong headed about. Um, but yeah, thank you. Any other questions? Just uh, All right, uh, I'm gonna do you in the back, yes sir? Hi. <laughs> Hi, Jake. We shot on Blackmagic 4K with a 24-105 Canon lens, the entire film. Nice. Lights, lights? Um, not a lot. <laughs> yeah, we used a six foot quasar overhead in the first act, and the lamp is a practical, and then the second act was very complicated. Um, a lot of practical stuff. I mean, the production design was important in that. We were trying to create a certain tech feel without a lot of tech stuff. And we just augmented with a lot of small fixtures. When was it the third act? The third act is interesting because as, as you probably remember from the location, there was this huge wall of windows. And I remember early on, Frank and I talking about the production design and the approach for that space. And it was supposed to be home, but it was supposed to be like digital home, I guess, and so it had to have this kind of, you know, like a dreamlike quality, and so the, the, the location we had was beautiful, beautiful home of a friend of ours, and it, it was overlooking the St. John's River, so much to, my son was key grip, and I remember I said, his name is Ian, I said, Ian, we had to do something on these windows, he goes, okay, what you want to do? I said, I want two layers of this queen on every window, and he's like, all right. <laughs> so three hours later, he all by himself, he double vis cleans all these windows, and it creates this really, you know, not only. Can you explain what vis queen is? It's it's like white plastic, white plastic you can buy at Home Depot. Um, it's cheap. It's cheap diffusion. In the in the business, we use diffusion to make light softer. So we did all that work, 
and it did two things. It created this kind of, where are we exactly? I mean, these are windows, but I don't see anything. So you're kind of like, oh, we're in this kind of dreamlike space. That is it real or is it not real? And then it created this just beautiful natural light that was so soft and diffuse and beautiful. Uh, and then we just used uh, probably a three by four light mat and a couple of LED wands to build a little bit of drama in the hair arts and stuff. But for the most part, that was it. Again, even in, a, in Act Three, which was probably our most expensive, like technically, and, and uh, that was really only what five people on 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 the crew. Like, well, hold on. So you, Me, uh, Jason, Jason, Justin, Ian. Ian. Thomas is sound. Thomas is sound, that's five. Two PAs, yeah. Yeah. So, five, I mean, five crew and then two PAs. I uh, think that the third act, by the third act, COVID had kind of worn off a little bit, so it wasn't quite as nuts, but still, I don't think we had more than a dozen people on set. That's right, yeah. Yeah, so it was very small. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a firm believer in that if you've got all of the other elements, I mean, the, and people make a big deal about these cameras. And getting, I mean, I'd love to shoot on a Alexa 35 or whatever but the budget wouldn't support it. So we did what we could with what we had. And it's about framing, it's about, just from a technical perspective, it's framing and lighting. It's having a damn good director of photography. Well, I mean, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I mean it's, it's, it's everything, right? I mean, it was easy because we had great performances to shoot. We had cool locations that we built. And we had a great story to tell. So, I mean, all and I didn't really learn it quite as strongly until this project. It's like, there's so many things that have to come together to make a great film. And the, it, the term that Brent always uses, which I love, is harnessing chaos. I yeah. think that's a that's a great sort of uh, thing that it's it's very it's very true. Sure. And I want to say something about the, the fellow asked a question, this guy, I think about what what the challenges were in the film. Budget. We, <laughs> we did this film for nothing. Nothing. And it's I mean it's amazing yeah. to me that it's I, I, Franklin alluded to this earlier. I saw some some Zoom rehearsals and stuff, and I'm I'm watching like, holy shit, this is a good story. We got we got to do this. And I called him up and said, what's going on with this? He goes, oh, we're just having some fun. I'm like, no, we're making a movie. He goes, really? I'm like, yeah, okay. So that that was it. That's how it starts. Yeah. That's how it always starts. So, All right. Uh, any any other questions? I think I'm sure we're back. Just one here. last yes, one. Yeah. I see. Yeah. Yeah, just oh, oh, hold on. There's, there's someone right behind you that had her hand up first, and then, and then, yeah, so I want to hear from you. Uh, <laughs> yes, ma'am. any wrong answer to that question. Uh, I love hearing all of the different answers and the diversity. I think that's a good thing. That's one of those moments that I might have an idea of what it means, but that doesn't uh, diminish or disqualify uh, what other people extract from that. I think there's there's so many different ways you can interpret that. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, machines aren't perfect and trauma is a cycle and uh, you know, Jerry has has to have a moment of clarity in, in that. So, you know, there's I think there's a lot of different ways to to interpret that, and I don't think there's a wrong way, uh, unless unless you think it's uh, to uh, I don't know go uh, buy Alexis like that's that's a wrong interpretation. But otherwise, uh, otherwise it's all good. Uh, yes, sir. I saw that. Yeah. Yeah. I just wanted to thank you for letting me give you a little help you a little bit. In the last scenes. Oh, hi! Yes, yeah, sorry, I couldn't see you. Yes, yes. Uh, so we see uh, we see this this gentleman's uh, hand and arm uh, it, <laughs> within those uh, those those last sequences. We always need uh, for, for when we were shooting Lance's scenes, we wanted to make sure that we were only shooting Lance's shots uh, when he was there because we only had him for a very short amount of time. Um, but. So in, in order to do that, we filmed all of Cherry's scenes first. So she never was interacting with Lance in any shot that you just see her, and for that we had a double in. And thank you so much for, for helping us with that. We really, really appreciate it. <laughs> yes, give her a hand. Give her a hand. Uh, 60 years just on the stage. This is the only film I had. 
didn't see me, but <laughs> you did a fine job. You did a phenomenal job. Thank you so, so much. Yeah. Uh, yes, sir, another question. Sure. <laughs> uh, Sounds good. Yeah. yeah. No, I de definitely there were there was a lot of moments that happened organically on set. It was just like, oh yeah, this is perfect for this reason, or you like, uh, you're like, oh yeah, obviously. The I I, I look at the first shot where she comes in and can't get the light to turn on automatically, and that's like kind of a moment of technology having sort of a, a, a flawed autonomy, and then she comes over to the lamp and is able to just like precisely control like how it turns on. So you have this like dynamic between autonomy and control and that's like the theme of the movie. And I was like, oh cool, didn't plan that, but great. Um, as far as like Garrett's character, yeah, I think it's, it's definitely important that people acknowledge that uh, he is probably like lost more of his humanity than uh, a character like Cherry who is inherently not human. Uh, so, so yeah, I think that's, there's, a lot of symbolism of, of that. It's even stated by, by your character when you say, uh, out of the four of us in this room, you're the only one that doesn't see, see him. And I think that's relevant. I think, uh, I hope that nobody uh, misinterprets that Gareth is, is not the protagonist, even though he definitely thinks he is, and the film sometimes frames him like the leading man. But uh, he, he is, by, by all accounts, he's the antagonist. He is the one that is, uh, <laughs> dealing with his trauma in a way that might be productive, but it's not healthy. Um, and his obsession with his intention uh, is what, as, as good and altruistic as it may be, the fact that he is unwilling to be open about his trauma is what inherently, accidentally, unintentionally leads to pain and suffering and trauma for Cherry. Um, so, <laughs> uh, yeah, I, you know, I, I don't want necessarily people to come out of this movie thinking like, I know the moral of the story, but I, I do hope that it incites conversation. Conversation about trauma, conversation about AI. Uh, like, like David said, AI is going to reflect the best and worst parts of us, and it's, it's our responsibility to approach it with compassion, integrity, and thoughtfulness. Um, and it's the same as being a parent. Yeah, and it's exactly. I think AI is more akin to a child than to Frankenstein's monster. Uh, so. Uh, take with that what you will. I think we'll take one more question, uh, but I'm sure they're going to want to kick us out. Yes, sir, in the back. Was the fur actually the power of the Charopod? Do the movement of Jesse mirror that of the Charopod celebration? So, I encourage everyone here if you enjoyed the film and you would like to support us more, uh, the film is available to watch on Amazon and iTunes. Uh, rent it, buy it, leave us a, a, a review if you like on. Uh, IMDb, Rotten Tomatoes, Letterboxd, whatever, whatever you like. And yes, I encourage you, indeed, watch closely the movements on the chessboard because they are important. And I, if, if, I'll tell you what, like you can find me on the gram and all that. If you can identify exactly what game they're playing, because it's a specific game from a championship, uh, it's a championship game. Uh, and not a, not one in like history. It's a it's a it's a relatively recent one. I had like one from like an old like an old game, and I was like, it's gonna be this one. And then I watched a game live, and I was like, they did exactly what I wanted. It's like black forces white into a a draw like in even fewer moves. It's got to be that one. So uh, yes, it is Carl Kahn, and I highly it, it recommend that you uh, watch the film again if you liked it, uh, d download it, buy it, uh, and. You can do that. There's also several other little details of Easter eggs. I'll give you this one. If you uh, <laughs> if you Google search what the admin code, if you Google search that number, it's an important number, and I'll let you discover why. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I didn't know that one till yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> I cannot thank you guys enough for coming to watch this movie. Cool, Again, thank you. thank you so so much for supporting hey. Thank you for All you. right. Thank you to everybody involved with this project. I know some of you in the audience also supported and worked on the project. Have a wonderful rest of your night, and please, if you have more questions, by all means, come up to me, come up to us, and, and talk to us. We love talking about this film, so by all means, enjoy the rest of your night. Uh.